It looks like there's a good number of people in here, so we'll get started. So uh, Blanche has a, a, a lot of time to, to speak to you guys. Um, so I'm just going to kick it off by uh, introducing her first. Uh, known as an intuitive designer that breaks the norms when it comes to empathic design practices, Blanche Garcia is a creative that continues to grow in her industry. She is an award-winning certified interior designer with over 25 years of experience in the design business. Blanche is also the principal uh, designer in the popular Travel Channel reality series, Hotel Impossible for Five Seasons. Uh, she helped tackle the job of revamping hotels all over the United States, along with the host, Anthony Melchiori. And now as a new mom, she continues to take on new challenges. Her design firm, B. Garcia Designs, located in Montclair, New Jersey, continues to grow by expanding her clientele and growing her diverse women-only firm. And she doesn't plan on slowing down anytime soon. Her unapologetic opinions, I love that part, and natural intuition are one of the things that make her stand out when it comes to captivating an audience. Okay, so I am uh, gonna hand it over to Blanche. And uh, for everybody that's watching, uh, we'll have a question and answer session after Blanche speaks. So if you have a question that you wanna ask, uh, just put it in the chat and that'll, be our, that'll become our list of questions to, to ask Blanche. Uh, without further ado, Blanche, please take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Are we good with volume yes. and everything? Okay, cool. Um, so I just wanna show, I know some of you may know who I am, uh, some of you who don't. Um, we are an interior design firm that works with a lot of different disciplines, like a lot of different um, you know, types of projects. I get bored very easily. And one of the things that are important to me is that I wanna be creative. Um, in all aspects. I do run a business, and if anybody has run a business or has parents or friends, um, a lot of time your, your time can be spent running the business. Um, but I do try to find balance. But I love all of my clients. I have great clients. I work really hard. One of the things that I value, and as a business owner and as a woman, is that um, I love all the projects I work on, and I love all the clients I work with. I have not one complaint, and I do not uh, wake up in the morning dreading going to work, um, but that's very purposeful for me. And so the way I run my business is as important to me as the type of projects that I do. Um, and that to me has always been very important. You will learn that the major differences out there with a lot of designers is that they may make a lot of money or designers may work on a lot of great projects, but a lot of times they're very stressed out by their clients and their projects and they do not like the work they're doing or they do not like the clients that they have, which is kind of, um, it's sad because this is our life. And so you should be happy with at least the majority of what you do every day. That being said, I just wanted to share my screen for a minute and um, show you a few of the projects that I really love. So you get a sense of who I am. And I'm gonna um, talk about this for one second without boring the crap out of you guys. So, um, can everybody see my screen? Okay. Yeah. You don't have to answer. Um, so what you're going to notice is that in every project that I do, they're always a little different. I, there's not just one, you're never going to see just one design and be like, that's bland. She did that just because I feel very strongly that I don't want to leave my imprint on somebody else's space. That is just one look that is, I'm not like a one trick pony. So for me, it's like, whatever their style is, whatever the vibe is, whatever's going on, I'm like kind of like just a filter for that. And if anything, my style is edited, I'll always have pops of color moments, but I like space for people to breathe. So um, the first one is Wyndham Trip Hotel. We just finished it about it two years ago. It's time is flying. But this was a whole boutique hotel. It's right in the heart of Newark and it's through the brand Wyndham Trip. Um, this project is really, um, it's very colorful and it's supposed to be about like 
interaction, social media, and a lot of touch points here had to do with actually Newark itself because Trip Hotel is about the areas that the hotels are in and it's about bringing some of that culture into the hotel. So there are moments here by like murals of people who were famous people born in Newark, um, saying street names, things like that. And pretty much everything here was custom. So this is a really cool project. Um, in the top corner, for instance, just to put a highlight, that is a sculpture that it actually wasn't complete in that picture. It, uh, it has another layer going to it that has different sayings by Thomas Edison because in Military Park, which is right around the corner from this hotel, is the first place that he ever exhibited um, electric light. Like the first time he ever showed it was at that park. So for me, it was like a big ode to it. So you can actually stand behind that light bulb and take pictures. So it's all about social media and posting and that type of stuff. Um, this is a residence, um, a complete custom residence that to this day I'm still working on. Again, these are clients that have become friends of mine. I've been working with them for probably about eight years now. And we have done different parts of their project and everything is custom. Um, and I love them to death. And they've got this California vibe, very earthy, very modern, but it's um, in New Jersey. It's in Livingston, actually. Um, and then if you see in the dining room, that's actually a funky mural. So <laughs> they were in, I forgot what town they're in, um, but I like they were like, that's them on their dog flying um, with their baby that she was pregnant with at the time coming in and behind them flying in um, in the mural. So they had this artist do it. It was actually really funky. Then this is a Manhattan corporate space. Sorry, I'm getting, this is Maddox. He's also an office worker. He wanted to be picked up. Um, so this is an office space in Manhattan. Um, developers, and this is obviously a very city vibe, very, very tone on tone and very sleek. Um, and this one is bathroom. This is actually my bathroom. I, this is custom bathroom that, and there's some things here that I really love. When you do a lot of your own space, you're able to do things. Sometimes clients don't always allow. So we went really high with the ceilings, um, fixed shower door. So it doesn't have like a full, it's all open. You can see that the drain on the bottom is an infinity drain, so you don't really see it. It's And you have to like pitch the floor in order to do that. That's actually a very hard thing to do. Um, so these are all a lot of details. We took mirrors that were standard mirrors and turned them into medicine cabinets with lucite acrylic um, shelves, blah, blah, blah. Okay, um, this one is a project that we're working on right now. It's a, a townhouse in Weehawken overlooking New York City. Everything is completely custom. Everything, it's like really beautiful materials. Everything's very bespoke. And um, we're probably gonna finish this in April. And this is a project in the city, uh, a lobby for the same developers that we did their office. So everything is, um, we designed the floor finishes, the floor, the floor pattern, the wall details, everything like that. So this is coming up. And that's pretty much it. So I just wanted to give you some background. Um, so when we talk about, when, when MJ brought this up to me, it was very interesting to me about um, Latinx and, and, and that thought process. And I've been doing design probably now for about 25 years. It's been, I feel like I've been doing it forever. And I have for the most part always known that this is what I wanna do. Now, that doesn't mean that I haven't done different things. I always view myself as a creative, and my design business is just an extension of that. I do other things as well. I write books. I public speak. I've done TV stuff. I've done all sorts of stuff. So for me, I didn't want to get limited and just put myself like, okay, you're just an interior designer. It's just one of the things that I do, and I, I get to express myself. When I started out in this industry, um, I was very young and I even looked younger at the time. I started out, I was 18 years old and I looked like I was five, literally. Um, nobody really took me seriously. And the only way for me to be taken seriously is to know what I was talking about. I was like a sponge because at the time, um, my father had passed away when I was younger and my mom, I don't know if anybody else can 
relate, but my mother did not want me to go to New York City to a school. She thought I'd be murdered and killed. And she's overprotective Latin mom. <laughs> and so um, I was very limited in, in the schools I could go to. And the things I want to talk about, the thing that kind of drove home for me as, um, as kind of a, a Latin woman and designer is a couple of things, how it affected me very early on. There weren't a lot of role models in my world doing what I wanted to do, meaning that just growing up, um, a lot of my cousins and relatives and even my close friends, um, I did not have the benefit of having a lot of people in this professional creative field because this is kind of a luxury, right? Um, a lot of our parents, had to do what they had to do to survive and to create a better life and to put food on the table. So saying that you wanted to be a designer of any sort is a little fluffy and it's not exactly a guarantee that you're going to make money back in the day. It's now it's definitely a little bit more structured and there's, you know, you're able to take your creative and put structure to it. And it's a and and there's likes to it. People actually will support it now and they'll say, oh wow, because because there's there are people out there, there are role models, and there's precedent, right? But when I was starting out, there wasn't as much precedent. I think the only person who actually was super, um, I would say, successful as a creative was like, um, uh, what's her name? Martha Stewart, someone like that. Um, and she had become a creative, a household name, but a lot of who she is is from nepotism and things like that. She came from a family and she had friends and she was born into a world a little bit that she had that support and she had those role models. Um, I think as a, a Latin woman, a lot of times the role models we have are hard workers, but it's not exactly someone who has the freedom to go and explore passions the way that we can now and to legitimize that, right? So I had to legitimize that at a young age and explain to my mom that this is what I wanted to do. And um, I remember her saying to me, oh, Nena, you know, this is like breaking into modeling. Like, this is hard. I don't know if you want to do this. And I was just like, yeah, I know, but I wanted, like, I just felt such a passion for wanting to create, right? And I didn't know what that looked like. And I had nobody to tell me, well, you go to this school, you do this. So I ended up just going, you know, to, um, I think I went to Berkeley, I took courses, I went to another school, Wilsey Institute, which by the way, is no longer around. And I got my degree. But at the time, I didn't know any, like, I had no guidance, right? Nobody to tell me like, oh, go to this school or take this or, you know, you, you, I didn't even know what a, um, I had no idea even what a uh, an internship was like, I honestly had no idea about internships until like I was already in the field and people were like, oh, you've never interned anywhere. And I just felt like an idiot. So I, I always felt kind of, I was behind the eight ball. And I, every time I, I, when I did get a hold and start getting into the world of design um, and because the school I went to was so small, there really wasn't a lot of role models. Like the things that we're doing right now, even these lunch and learns, there was not that. And when I went to a designer to ask them, you know, what their thoughts were or to give advice, their answer to me was like, basically, well, nobody showed us what to do. So you just have to figure it out. And I was like, okay. So I just learned by watching and just soaking up and honestly faking it till you made it. If I went, when I was working for people or when I went out there, I would watch, see what would happen, um, see what I didn't know, note it. And that night I would look into or go to the bookstore. Again, when I was 18, uh, the internet wasn't even that big. So it wasn't like Google was really around. I know it sounds, I feel like I'm sounding like a, a freaking dinosaur, but it's the truth. It's literally my world. So because of that, I think it really affected that I had to be hungry for what I wanted. It wasn't handed to me. And I had to like have a passion for it because I don't think you do anything in this world unless you're passionate for it. Um, you can do things because you're told to do things and you can do things because they're expected of you, but that only goes so far. Eventually something happens, it filters out, you become angry or you don't like your life. So for me, my experience was because I didn't have any role models or people in this field. My mom cleaned houses for a living, not because she wasn't extremely smart, but because she needed to be there for me when I got out of school and she needed to take care of me and have flexibility. And I went with her to clean people's houses. Um, 
And so like, I'm aware of that. So that's kind of for me, how it affected me because um, in this arena, by the time I was in my twenties or whatnot, I had had maybe one or two friends that had gone to school and they went to like very expensive schools or they went to, you know, they had friends that knew certain people and I didn't have that. So I'm very proud of that where I am today. Um, I got here pretty much by me figuring it out, me figuring out how to run my business, how to run the numbers, how to balance the checkbooks, how to pay people. Um, I do, I taught myself AutoCAD um, just because I'm kind of dyslexic and I'm not really good. I had to learn early on that I'm not good at somebody just showing me something and that's how I learn. So I remember taking AutoCAD two, three times, by the way, and never hit me. And then I was um, literally, I remember that I was working multiple jobs. I was doing interior design, but I was also doing other jobs because it was not like jumping off. I just remember that I was probably in my um, early 20s and I was like, I don't know what's going on. It's not tracking. I'm feeling like stuck. And I remember going, well, I need to go work for somebody else. I took a step back and I said, I need to go work for somebody else and learn a model of how business is done. Cause you have to remember I had never done an internship or any of these things, even though I had had my own business. It's a lot of failure sometimes back and forth. Like success is like a zigzag. It's not like <laughs> a, fur a trajectory that's like you just launch and it's like wonderful. That does happen. That is some people's stories and that's awesome. It is not the normal story. So I remember when I had to go work for somebody and to figure out what I didn't know actually. Um, I needed to learn AutoCAD because I had forgotten it. I'd taken it in classes in schools and I was like, I don't, I don't remember any of this. Um, and I just didn't have the money to afford another class. So what I was like, okay, how am I going to learn this? So I remember going to the bookstore, um, at the time, Barnes and Nobles, they had AutoCAD. I don't think it was for dummies or something, but there was a CD in the back that had 30 day CD. And I took it home and every day after work at night for 30 days, I practiced for two to three hours. And then when I ran out of that CD, I went back to the bookstore and bought another book. So it was an investment of $60, but that's how I learned because I learned by doing, and I couldn't afford the program at home at the time. Um, I ended up working for an architectural firm for many years in Summit, learning what I didn't know, learning what I wanted my business to be like, and learning what I did not want my business to be like. And that was a really important lesson for me. Um, but that's what I say. And that's how I say that, you know, for me, because I didn't have those like, oh, well, here's just a school and you can do whatever you want. And there's different people to teach you all the time. Here's all these mentors. Um, it was a different path for me. But right now as a woman in design and as especially a Latin in design, I don't feel like there are any barriers for me. Just so you know that in the world of design, you are going to deal with a lot of contractors. You're also going to deal with a lot of architects, a lot of clients. Um, as, as a woman myself, when I walk into the room, my presence walks in first. I own my power. I stand in my power and I know who I am. It's taken me years to formulate that. That's one of the most important things you're ever going to learn because it's so important. There is what you know, right? Which is the backbone. That's how you, that's how when you talk to a client, when you talk to a contractor, what you know will basically stand in a room without you. And if you don't know something, you need to just say, oh, you know what? I don't really know that. Let me just get back to you with it. If you come honest, if you come with authenticity, that will be a respect for you. If you get to know who you are as a creative and as a, as a person, right? Then when you are, because you have to understand something, people come to you as a taste maker. They will come to you know, to, to, to be that person who, when they don't know answers, you will know the answers, right? So getting to know who you are before you put yourself out there is one of the most important things you can do. For me, when, when MJ introduced me and he talks about, and I, and I put in my bio that I'm empathic or I connect or those things, those are the things that my clients know who I am. So it is very important. Anybody can design a pretty room, okay? There's a billion of us out there. 
Anybody can design a pretty room. Anybody can do the tech and anybody can do just the knowledge. But learning who you are, what you love, the type of person you want to be in your work is one of the most important things that you will actually bring to the table. And to this day, I have clients. I draw the people that I love in my work to me based on the type of person and, and business owner that I am. Okay. And know that that's very important because it'll make the difference between the work that you hate and the work that you love. Right. And to this day, I have clients who say to me, listen, Blanche, we love working with you because you connect, you, you, you want to know about us. You, you come from a place of just being grounded. Those are things that are very important. But that came from me having to figure out so many things by myself. Um, now, everybody's path is different. And there's probably a lot of you that are on this call right now that have come here from all different backgrounds and from all different paths. And that is okay. There is not one way to success. And your personal success is going to look very different from somebody else's. So don't compare yourself to somebody else. Because in this arena, and even with me, you have to know that it's very easy for me to compare. I've been doing this for a very long time and I too pick up social media and things like that. And I see what's going on out there. Let those things inspire you, let them drive you, but make your only competition yourself, who you are. Try to be better than what you put out yesterday. That's the best advice that I could probably give because it stops me when I'm doing my work, I have blinders on, meaning that I don't care what the world and everybody else is doing. What I care about is the work that feels right to me. And also I care about what my client, what the vision is, right? What's the energy of the project? What does it want to be? Because your project will talk to you and you know the difference between what feels right in your work and what doesn't. Start checking in with yourself. When you have questions, go, does this feel right to me? Or does this feel like I'm going down the wrong path. Those are the things when we talk about intuitive and being intuitive in your work and with, with clients, with the people you work with in your projects, I want you to really get to know that that little voice inside of you, that little voice is going to lead you through your, the rest of your school. It's going to lead you through your work, how you deal with your bosses, your clients, all of these things. It's going to be that voice that says this feels right or this feels wrong. So if you can connect with that, you all the choices you make will be authentic to you. And it's very simple. If you have a pan and imagine you are this pan and the pan is dented, everything you make out of that pan, whether it's cakes, will always be dented. You wanna make sure that you are clear, you are transparent, you know who you are. Every decision you make after that in your creative will then come from a place of like, oh yeah, that feels right. No, that doesn't feel right. And you can practice this in little ways, but that's the most important thing you will do today in your career that will help you catapult you in every part of it. That's really it. So I'd like to um, open it for questions if MJ is okay with that, just because I like to get feedback and I like to be able to answer whatever questions anybody has about anything. Sure. So, yeah, I didn't see anybody uh, type any questions into the chat, but um, if anybody has one that you want to voice, please uh, say it now. Um, otherwise, if you want to put a question in the chat box, um, we'll, we'll talk to Blanche um, that way as well. Yeah, and even if, we, if there's something about any part of, you know, I've, had a, I've been very blessed and I've had different parts of my career, meaning that... Um, I've been able to explore a lot of different things, whether it was designing on TV, whether it was writing about design um, and all like what, I mean, I remember I've even designed a funeral home and designed <laughs> hotels. And so I've been able to run the gamut of the type of creative projects that I've been involved in. So I've been really fortunate with that. Uh, so Vanessa is asking, what is your favorite interior design style? I would probably say that it is modern, um, but I would say it's more contemporary than modern. 
um, it's evolved. So I was just having this conversation with the girls in my office the other day that I had horrendous taste when I first became a designer. Like when I was in school, I literally sucked. Like when I say, when I really, looking back, I'm horrified at the stuff I picked out, like the colors. I knew nothing about lighting. Lighting scared the crap out of me. I was like, I don't, I don't, it was like just this big, weird, dark hole. I was like, I don't, that's a lot. And I remember color, um, getting it wrong all the time. And my style was so like much. I also was one that I, I was probably, it was like the nineties. So everything was like velvets and burgundies and greens and faux painting. It was really bad. Um, and then as you start getting into like your world of design, you're going to see from even the style you like now will be so different from the style you end up going to only because you you like what you're exposed to meaning that right now in school you are designing probably what you gravitate towards right like your loves things like that the more you start designing outside of your box because you're going to interact whether it's people work things like that and you're going to get to know different styles different um traveling things like that you're like oh i like that and you're going to start like melding into different directions so the the taste that you have now is going to evolve so much so i would say like right now it's very much clean edited um for me personally um and but i like natural i like natural elements i like to feel like biophilia or i like nature involved i love lots of light but I always like clean and that, and, and I love so many different um, styles, but when I'm home, because I'm in so many people's heads, I just, I need it to be like very clean and modern. And that just makes me feel good. Uh, Jenny asked, how do you feel about the students learning from influencers on platforms like YouTube or TikTok? They share their work in a shorthand video process and their personalities come through just as much as their work and they are so interactive. Do you think this even changes our perspectives of what an interior designer is? Is that a good or a bad thing? Wrong question. I think it's a good thing and I think it's really important. Listen, when, like I said, when I started out, there were gatekeepers and I think that, um, I think that it's really important to go with the times. Now, as a designer, you know that there's a huge difference between a designer and a decorator, right? And there's an education behind that. And there's many hours of work and things like that. I think that needs to be um, respected. Meaning that when I go to talk to a client, I educate as part of what I talk to them about because they need to understand the difference, right? There's a difference between a surgeon working on them and an RN nurse, right? There's a big difference. And I, and I always explain that to them. Not that one is better than the other, but there are different tools for different things. So there is an understanding of that. But I think in today's society, it is so important. Like where it, it, design is now more um, commonplace. It's more easier for people to connect to. When a couple of years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was really big about, um, oh, clients knowing what your where your furniture brands are from or how much you're spending. I'm very transparent with my clients. They know how much money a piece costs and they know what my markup is. I'm very transparent. It's I'm not hiding it or whatnot. You'll have a lot of old school designers that they're like, oh, this is how much the piece is. You don't know where it's coming from, blah, blah, blah. I don't care if my clients buy product from me. If they buy it from me, there's a fee associated with that. If they don't buy it from me, that's fine. But you have to figure out how to get that item to your house and don't call me when there's a problem with it. That's how I deal with my clients. So if you're going to handle a, a product from cradle to cradle, you handle it and you pay for it. If you want me to handle it, there's a price associated with that. So there's just complete transparency. Now in design, we're up the next echelon, there's social media. We do TikTok in my office. We do like all the social media outlets. There are designers out there or people getting to know um, design and putting it out there really in a great way. So I, I love that, but understand that style has no price tag in a way. Now, there is quality and there are certain things that people are going to have to pay for. And there's also a difference when you have clients, young clients that are looking at those TikToks and going, well, she did it this and she did that. Why am I going to pay her this amount of money? And I'm going to pay you that amount of money. But she looks like she does it easier. 
you have to explain your background and you have that also goes back to who you are if you know who you are you're going to be able to pitch yourself and understand that you're explaining who you are as a quality because when somebody is buying your services they're not buying your services they're buying you so you have to know who you are because there's 20 people 50 people a day that can do what we do so when I pitch myself, when I put myself out there, I'm leaving an imprint in people's lives. I'm leaving an imprint on social media, things like that, my own personal imprint. So yes, can they go on YouTube? Can they go on TikTok? Can they go on all these platforms and learn something that might be different from what I'm teaching? Sure. But if you want me, if you want what I can do, there is a reason that I charge what I charge. There's a reason for what I do and we're all different, but I do think that it's great that it's out there. And if you're one of those people that love being on social media and love putting yourself out there, it's awesome and it's fun and it's relatable. Uh, Jeffrey asked, what hurdles do you see in the interior design industry in New Jersey for Latinx emerging professionals? I don't see any blocks at all. The only blocks I see are the ones you're going to put on yourself. You can do anything and be a part of any organization and whether you want to do commercial, residential, all of those things. The only thing that I say to you is that when you're putting yourself out there, this goes back to knowing who you are. Sit down with yourself and figure out what you don't know, right? Write down the things you don't know. And then figure out how to fill in what you don't know so that you can be the best designer out there because competition is stiff. It's really hard out there. So you need to basically, your, what you don't know will be your weakness. It will be your kryptonite. You will feel insecure about it. And that insecurity will show every time you enter a room. So get to know what you don't know. Feel comfortable in it. It's okay. There's tons of things I still don't know. My list is so long. And in design, it's like a mountain. But tackle it piece by piece. Get to know people who can help support what you don't know, teach you online. There's so many avenues to learn. Um, so I think that that's important. I also think it's very important that if you're just graduating school and you're like, I want to have my own business, you really should go at least um, work for somebody else. Mark, you just look at this in case it's a um, Work for somebody else or intern with somebody else because what you will learn in school is like, 10% of what you need to know about the business of design. It's not even, you're not even tipping the iceberg. And I hate to say it, but the time frames that you have with to work on projects is probably um, this big compared to how much time you have to work in the real world. So when that's usually the, the thing that comes out the, the, <laughs> the most glaring when people come to me is that they're just like blown away and they're just like, what? I did a group project, we had three months to work on this or eight weeks. And I'm like, that's cute. I need you to design a house in four weeks. And I need you to just check in with me, but I need you to like pull things, fabrics, materials, elevations, lighting plans, blah, blah, blah. And it's usually like, <laughs> so. Uh, Carrie asked, what are some upcoming trends that interest you? So the colored kitchen is coming back. I personally love, um, I love white kitchens. I, I have a white kitchen. We're redoing our kitchen, but I have a black island coming in. But colored kitchens are coming back. I love that. I love, I'm, I'm really big into well design. Like the whole thing with COVID and what's been going on and everything, if there's a silver lining in the design world, please know that that silver lining is more authenticity in design more connecting to nature. People are home more. People who go to work, they don't have to be at work. So when you are in these places, they want to make sure they're enjoying their space. So the most important thing that I've seen come out of it that excites me so much is um, wellness and design, meaning like bringing plants from the outside and making it feel more natural, more connection. Um, the lighting that you use, that it, it doesn't, you know, bother you so much. Like the things where before people were like, ah, it's fine. Um, or it's cheap. I'm just going to buy it. Like people want experiences and they want to feel good in their spaces. And this is now trending towards more um, authenticity and design. Okay. Uh, Jocelyn is asking, as part of the Latinx community, do you see higher diversity now in the industry? And that's kind of it, um, one of the reasons why I invited you here is that we have such a high population of Latinx students um, but in my own 
you know, dealings with professionals in the interior design profession, I don't see that many of them um, as professionals. So, a hundred percent, a hundred percent, and I see more diversity now. Let me show you an example. So, coming up, um, and I say coming up, I was always compared to the only other Latin designer in my world that we both were on Design Star. Both kicked off the first episode. Both, she went, and I don't know if you know her, um, Vanessa De Leon, she's another Latin designer, right? And we know each other, but it's so funny because she went to do Restaurant Impossible, I went to do Hotel Impossible. So we're in a similar vein and we've been part of ASID and different committee and different associations. Do you know that to this day, her name comes up every time in like, oh, do you know? It's like the only other Latin person, like we must know each other and always they compare us because there's not that many that um, are in the design world, but also in the design world in a public way. Okay. So it's true. And so now they're, they are making it more diverse with a lot of the, the, I see it like, you know, New York design center, when they have their, their, their different events, they're involving more um, different nationalities and they're doing it in TV. And so I do think it's a whole new world. Um, and there wasn't a, as much representation and listen, do you know that most of my life growing up, when I went to go talk to contractors and contractors have also evolved a little bit, but went for the first, I don't know, 20 years, 15 years of my career, um, we would go talk or something and there would always be some sort of comment. They'd be like, ah, oh, Garcia, so you're Latin? You don't look Latin, you, you look white, so it's good enough, you, you know, you could pass. And I'm like, oh, okay, thank you. I'm so glad I got a ticket to the club. Um, so you do get com comments like that and it's, it's just, being more inclusive, making sure that there's, you know, a representation for all of them. And that's where it goes back to that I wasn't raised with role models in my industry that were like me or my parents or, or cousins or family. It's just not a career path that everybody chose. So I didn't have an example. Um, next question is, what is your creative process when you meet a client for a potential product? project? So I qualify real heavily, meaning that, that I am not for everybody and not everybody is for me. I say no more than I say yes. I turn down projects. I turn down money more than I take them on. I'm very selective. Why? Because I want to make sure that we have a connection. I want to make sure that I feel passionate about your project for whatever reason. And I want to make sure that you understand my boundaries and who I am. So I have set up how I work. Um, I'm very clear and I'm very clear how I get paid. I'm very clear about what I'm worth and I'm very clear on how you communicate with me. And I express that to my clients the first time I meet with them and I get a sense with what their expectations are. So I've been doing this a while and if you start talking to somebody, there are some red flags, right? We all have red flags. Now, maybe a lot of you haven't been in the design world. You're not out there in the field, but you have your own red flags, right? So when you meet a friend, you're out, and you meet a potential friend and they're talking to you and there's just certain things you're like, oh my God, this is so amazing. Oh no, oh no, no. And it's like, bing, 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 bing. Or you're dating and you meet a guy or girl and it's like, bing, bing, bing. There's flags, right? So in business, when I'm talking to a client, there are flags that I look for. Um, are there expectations there? They're like, oh, I want it yesterday. I want to start right away. And you're like, oh, in today's culture and any design culture, it takes time. It's not going to happen yesterday. And if you have that expectation, you're going to expect me to jump through fire hoops. And I am not going to give up my life balance to do that. And if you want me to rush for things, there's a price associated with that, but I'm going to manage my expectation because if I put that burden on my team to now rush, 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 rush to manage your expectations, everybody's stressed. Nobody likes working, right? And there's no balance. So that's like one of the red flags. Um, oh, I love things cheap. That's another red flag. I love, you know, I, I, I'm very DIY. I have a really, really tight budget and it's not a realistic budget, right? And so I always tell them, you can have a budget, okay? But my work is the price it is for my work. It does not change regardless of your budget. So if your budget is $15,000, my work may be $15,000. That's your whole budget. Hiring a designer is a luxury for a lot of places. Now, you may say, I want to be that designer. That's that DIYer. I'm going to put a consulting fee together. I'm just going to like consult with people to get them to 
realize their lifestyle and their house or their business in a way that they can afford. Perfect. Know who you are. You want to do e-design, know who you are. Me, I like to do custom design. I like beautiful products. I do mix it in with retail. I buy Wayfair. I do buy All Modern. I buy all sorts of different, I mix. But what I do comes with a price tag and I educate them with that. You know, it's a luxury to hire most designers and they have to understand that because just like I can't go out and hire a chef to cook my whole event meal without paying a price for it, there's a difference between that and cooking the whole meal myself for like 50 people. So you have to educate people. So I'm very clear on my parameters and I explain how I work. I also explain how I communicate, meaning that um, you cannot be texting me like rapid fire while you're at home goods looking at towels. I will literally put a stop to that in five seconds. Um, payment, I make sure that I let my client know. I take 75 to 80% of payment upfront. Why? Because my intellectual property, when I present to a client, everything that I have given, all of my ideas are in that presentation. So there, that work has been uploaded, front loaded. So I, I charge my client in accordance with that. Um, so there are certain things that I do and I qualify. So sometimes a lot of times we don't even get to the hiring or whatnot because either I've walked away or I've said, this isn't the right client for me, or maybe they don't think I'm right for them because of, of the amount of money. And I'm okay with that. Not everybody's going to be your client. You have to be comfortable in that. You will be happier and believe it or not, you will make space for the right projects and the right clients. Uh, next question is, where do you look for inspiration or what helps you get inspired in every project? Um, mostly, especially nowadays, is a lot social media and then my projects, meaning that um, I look at social media, I do look at Instagram, I do look at Pinterest and I'm like, wow, that's amazing. But a lot of times when I go to meet a client or go into a project, I put myself emotionally there. I feel the energy. Like I was in a house yesterday. It's a young couple. She's a food blogger. You can tell they're excited. They have a little child. They want to have more. And they're moving from this, they're moving from Hoboken. And um, it's a fun project. She loves color. She loves like boho chic. She loves like a lot of mixed things. And you can tell she's a little bit of a risk taker. Um, I also noticed that she loves to wear red lipstick. I know that sounds odd to a lot of people, but a woman who likes to wear red lipstick likes that moment, right? They, they like that moment where you're just like, because I can't wear red lipstick. I have really big lips. Now they're getting thinner as I'm getting older, but I used to have really big bougie lips. So in like the 90s, when I put red lipstick on, I just looked like I was a fly girl or like part of like, I don't know, salt and pepper, which again, ages me. So I was, so I can't do it. So the woman that can pull off a red lip, I'm always like, yeah, like, okay. You're like a little bit of a daredevil. So that tells me so much about the design, right? That tells me like, she's risking. She's, she wants to be like moments. So that inspires me. And I immediately am like, we're going to have fuchsia moments. Maybe we'll have teal moments. We're going to keep it kind of sleek. We're going to, so I start with that inspiration. And then I always go to Pinterest, social media images. And I go, Ooh, and then one leads to the other. It's like a rabbit hole, right? One leads to the other. You open one image and you're like, Oh yeah, that's the detail I was looking for. And you're like, but what if we made it better? What if we, and you personalize it. So it's really just like a, a mental collaboration. Uh, so now I know the answer to this, but I think this would be good for you to explain to the students. The next question was, do you limit your work to the tri-state area or do you open yourself to clients who may be a plane ride away? Now, I want to add on to that, you know, especially in the light of, you know, what you're saying about work-life uh, balance. So how do you choose your project in terms of the, the location? I work anywhere all over the world how I work is very different. So I have done projects literally all over the world. I've literally even done projects like in Egypt and things like that. But for the most part, I always tell my clients up until COVID, I've always said to them, listen, depending on the budget, this is how much it is. If you want me to fly out there, if you want me to be more hands-on, this is the package I give you. If you want more of an e-design where you submit to me, maybe you have a team that will do the measurements, submit everything to us, we come up with the design, the elevations, the millwork, the selections, all of those things. We then boomerang it back to you and you implement it. And we can do 
consultation from overseas or from remote or things like that. So I tailor it to the type of client and their budget, right? I've had clients that buy packages for me, even hotels in like California that have bought room packages for me and then just go and implement it themselves. And I've had other projects where I've been more hands-on and we've gone out there to document, to present, to all sorts of things, right? Um, with COVID, especially I have a, a young child, uh, I don't really travel as much like that because I'm I'm being very you know uh, cognizant of the fact that I have a young child who can't get vaccinated, so everything is pretty much remote. So I still do overseas all around the world, but a lot of times when I talk to them, I, I offer them packages, or I'll have my team. I'll say if you want us to go out and document, I can have you know somebody from my office come out X, Y, and Z. Um, question, what is the culture in your office like? And can you like describe how many people you have in your office and things like that? Yes, um, very well. So um, we have about four people. I'm actually looking for somebody else. So if anybody out there, we have been looking for a little bit now and um, I'm looking for a junior designer and yes, they can be in school and yes, it is flexible. Um, it's very collaborative. We have one central office, but we hybrid. So there are days we're in that we collaborate together. And then there are days that we work solo on our own. Um, we, for being a small boutique office, that does not negate the fact that we work on a lot of big projects. We probably work, like right now we have eight to 10 projects from um, new construction, we're about to present in three weeks a house from the ground up that we've designed pretty much every detail of the house. And there will be like 20 rendered views and blah, blah, blah. Um, we're doing a wealth management office in Chatham. Like we do a lot of big, big projects and, and, and a lot of custom work. But the reason I'm able to do that is because I work very quickly at what I do. I'm able, you know, experience allows you to zone in and quickly like go through things. And the people I work with, um, they're, they're very creative and they're very good at what they do. So right now there is another lead designer and we pretty much work tandem. Um, I do AutoCAD as much as she does. We do different projects, but I also do a lot of, um, like I said, book and PR and whatnot. So I actually, my executive assistant, she also does a lot of my PR, a lot of packages, um, book stuff, all of that stuff. So we work that. I have a bookkeeper that works full time. Um, but it's actually like a pretty collaborative, like very flexible office. Like today we, we came in at like 11. Um, then we'll probably, I'll kick off at like 4.30. I have a, a pick up my daughter, um, may do a little bit of work tonight. And so everybody's pretty flexible. We are not a nine to five Monday through Friday, very strict. Um, you know, we hang out, we chit chat and we kind of, we work hard, but we also play hard. And, it, and it's a very open door policy. When I work with a lot of the people that work with me, they work with me, not necessarily for me. And I like to make sure that everybody, any relationship that I have, whether it's in my business, and I hope that's what you take away from this. And I hope that you understand this, whether it's in work or your business or your friends or whatnot, any relationship you have, there has to be an even exchange of energy. You both have to be happy. You both have to walk away from the table feeling like you're heard and you're seen. So when I work with the people I work with or my clients, we make sure that we're both happy. And if something feels off, we bring it to the table. Uh, the next two questions I think I'm going to add together because they're kind of related. Do you suggest any resources that help build your interior design business? And then what would you recommend students to do now in school in order to prepare for the business aspect of interior design? There is a big missing component to when uh, students graduate um, in business. It's, it, there's a missing component. And, and it's been that, that way for a very long time. I understand the focus on the artistic. I understand the focus on a lot of the color theory and, and fabrics and things like that. But I think it's really important if you don't wanna be slapped up the face once you start working for somebody that you start to integrate some of the real world business aspects into your everyday. Now, that can mean taking some business courses, um, how to, you know, put budgets together, what a design office, like, how does that work? How, what's the hierarchy of it? How do you write proposals? 
How do clients, how do you bid to clients? Um, things like that. And I also think that if you can challenge yourself um, when you're working on projects, okay, you have a lot of schoolwork. I'm sure there's a lot of deadlines, things like that. There's, you have to understand that you're being allowed to design, you're giving case studies, right? A lot of times it's like, this is, you know, maybe this is a case study and you're a designer on this case study, but you're not being challenged enough to understand that there are a lot of boundaries within the projects you're going to be working on. And that's going to be time constraints, monetary constraints, and there's going to be opinions. There's going to be things that you have to work with that you're not going to like, other furniture materials that you would have to work in that do not agree with the aesthetic the client wants. All these things do not be, are not a part of a lot of the presentations that you're doing. And you're given a lot more time and you're able to work in groups a lot of times. Um, so I challenge you to make some of those projects a little bit more realistic and add some of your own parameters in there that maybe the teachers aren't asking you for. Put a budget together, a realistic budget. Find out what a realistic budget is. Talk to designers about what would be a realistic budget for something like this. Um, put, come up with a profile of a client he hates the color red, but he wants to design a Chipotle. Hates the color red though. Um, he, his wife thinks she's a designer and she would like to pick out five key items for the project that you absolutely hate and now figure out how to work those in and make it look good. Um, things like that. Um, and then if you can intern for anybody, even if you're in class, even if you can do it a couple of hours a week, it's one of the most, I think, valuable things you can do. That's great. We, we do have an internship requirement now. So um, yeah, that, that's one thing we really um, are hoping that everybody will get, get that experience before they graduate. It's important. I think that makes a big, I've seen the biggest difference between designers who have done internships and ones who don't and their success after school. Um, what do you look for in a resume and portfolio or any advice for those who might not have the experience in a particular field of interior design? But want to pursue in that direction? Okay, some of the teachers aren't going to like this answer. Um, <laughs> I don't really care about your portfolio. The reason I don't care about it is because you could have done it with 50 people and you could have picked out a chair in it. You could have, you could have, I don't know what you did. And also it could have taken you your whole year, your last year, it could have taken forever to get all of this together. I don't know what you're like under pressure. I don't know what you're like working alone, having to figure things out. Um, I, I, I have those, your portfolio doesn't tell me that. And they're all great. I, every portfolio I've seen for the most part are 90% great. They're so technical, they're amazing. Um, but it doesn't tell me the things that I would need to know in running up my business. Um, can I depend on you to work on your own? Um, can you problem solve? Can you come to me when you have an issue or something, you, you're not getting it? I need you to be able to, I look for somebody when they come to me, I do look at their resume because I do look at how clean they've put it together. Your resume should not look like it's so personalized that it distracts from what it's saying. I want to see what it's saying. I don't want to see an art project. That's what your resume, I want to see taste. I wanna see your font. What did you decide on your font? Does your font look like somebody tagged the size of school bus? Cause I don't wanna see that. I wanna see taste. I wanna see restraint. You know, if you can show me that it shows me what your design sense more so is the layout of your portfolio shows me more of your design sense because that I know you did it yourself. Okay, how you laid it out, how big you made words, where you put things, that shows me everything. What's in it just shows me a group project. So when I meet with somebody, what's important to me is that, are you a free thinker? Am I meeting somebody that the lights are on upstairs? Meaning that, are you having a conversation with me? Or are you just, when I ask you questions, I'm like, hey, so what do you love about design? I like red. And you're like, okay, anything else? Anything, any other? You know, I want interaction. I want to know that you're there. And I look for somebody who's passionate about it. You don't have to know all the answers. I've had people come to me and say, 
listen, I, um, I love design. I don't know everything, but I, I want to really learn this or I want to learn that. That lets me know that you're interested, that you're, you know what I mean? And are you a hard worker? If you don't know something, um, will you come to me and say, listen, I, I really don't know this, but um, let me do a little research uh, or is there any direction you can give me and I'll figure it out. So those are the things, somebody who's outgoing, somebody who shows up, somebody who's, I can tell has like a good sense of things and seems like they're hardworking. And then yes, some of the technical skill, obviously we all need. Yes, um, AutoCAD, do you have a, a good sense of style? That is important to me. But when you come to me, you're coming to me raw. So a lot of the things you're gonna learn, I'm going to have to teach you. Even your knowledge of fabric and color is limited. So all of those things I'm gonna have to teach you, as long as it's not like you're not tragic and you have a sense of style, I'm going to be able to work with you. But I cannot teach you I cannot teach you work ethic. I cannot teach you somebody who's outgoing. I can't, I can't buy you a personality. So you have, those are the things that I'm going to need to know that like, are you, you know, we're pretty happy. We're all happy here. We're pretty, you know, so just things like that is what I look for. So again, it may not be the popular answer, but that is the answer. So we're, we're at one o'clock. Did you want to, you know, say any one last thing to, to wrap it up uh, for us, Blanche? Um, I just want to say, I hope that everybody who is in this industry or that you're in school for this, that you love it because it's, 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 it's hard, you know, and there's a lot of different avenues, but it's, it's so worth it if you love it. Um, and it's so rewarding and you get to go in any direction you want to go in and you get to change your mind. Um, so really explore and figure out. And if you don't love it, try to sit with yourself and figure out what is it that you don't love and what can you tweak? Um, because I, I love this industry. I love, love, love the different aspects that you can be in. And I still haven't tackled all of them. There's so much more that I still want to do. So I just want to make sure that check in with yourself every once in a while when you're on the hamster wheel and just make sure that you like what you're doing. That's all. Great, great words. Thank you so much for your time. And, you know, speaking for everybody, you know, just thank you for everything that you said and you know, everything that you've accomplished um, in your career, I think, you know, it's really an inspiration to, to everybody, so. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Great. Um, and if anybody has any questions or anybody, honestly, we put, um, uh, MJ has my email address or even my website, bgarciadesigns.com. You can always message me, ask me questions, things like that. I'm always happy to answer. I have a feeling you're gonna be getting some resumes in the next, uh, Good. I need them. I need them. I listen, I have been searching and it's not because I haven't met with a billion people. I'm looking for the right people. I always like, I love who I work with. We all get along so great. It's very important for me that they want to work with me and now I want to work with them and everything. So if you know of anybody, yes, send them in. Okay. <laughs> Where is your office space? I don't know if I got that. Um... Uh, we are in Montclair. So we're at 96 Park Street in Montclair. And um, the person I'm looking for can work from home and also come in the office some days and we have flexible hours and whatnot. I'm just looking for the right person. Great. Okay. Thank right. you, Thank everybody. You. Thank you everyone for coming. See you at the next one.